Thank you. The next item of business is portfolio questions, and the portfolio is justice and veterans. In order to get as many members in as possible, I would prefer short and succinct questions and answers to match. Uh, if a member wishes to request a supplementary question, they should do so by pressing the request to speak button during the relevant question or by entering the letter R uh, in the chat function during the relevant question. I call question number one, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting the court system to clear the current reported backlog of cases. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. In 2021-22, we provided £50 million to support the Recover, Renew, Transform programme for the criminal justice system, which included setting up 16 new solemn and summary courts. For 2022-23, we committed a further £53.2 million, including £26.5 million for the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to help them maintain enhanced court capacity. We have also extended funding for remote jury centres for an additional three months to support the transition back to juries in court, and we have increased the SCTS resource budget by 3.5 per cent. The latest stats published by SCTS show these measures are having an impact, but justice agencies have been clear that it will take several years to address the backlog, and we will continue to support that work. Alice Allen. Yeah, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Uh, one of my constituents has been waiting for an update uh, for several months on his case. The local procurator fiscal's office have been unable to give an indi any indication of when his case will be processed, as they say this is done centrally. Can the Cabinet Secretary give an indication of whether there are any plans to allow for more local processing of uh, procurator fiscal cases, uh, in case that might help ease some of the waiting times? Cabinet Secretary. The, the member will know that the processing of cases is a matter for the Lord Advocate as part of an independent role as head of the prosecution system. So I therefore recommend that the member contact the Lord Advocate, both in terms of the specific case and also in terms of the suggestion he's made about lo more localised processing. And the Lord Advocate should be able to advise on his query. A supplementary, uh, Jamie Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Yesterday's spending review is devastating for the justice sector with legal aid. The judiciary and courts and tribunal service all receiving a real terms cut over the next five years. It was described by the Scottish Police Federation as a bad day for the public and a good one for criminals. Another prominent uh, solicitor has said it is a nail in the coffin for legal aid. Uh, Minister, given these substantial cuts to the justice system over the next few years, will this help or hinder the government's ability to get through the massive 40,000 backlog of cases that is currently sitting in the system. And what effect will this have, more importantly, on victims? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think there is no question that the 5.2 per cent cuts in this government's budget will have an impact on all services in Scotland. And it is regrettable that the Conservatives do not feel it within themselves to actually condemn that cut and to seek a more beneficial settlement for Scotland. But, of course, yesterday was not a budget. Yesterday was a spending review. The budget will come forward in due course. And during the process of that uh, budget, uh, being decided, I will of course put the case for continued investment in justice services, whether it is the police or our court service. Question number two, Stephen Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to involve victims more in the justice system. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, enabling victims to take a more prominent role in the justice system is a key commitment in our recently published justice strategy. We are currently consulting on potential legislative reforms to strengthen victims' rights and to improve their experiences including the establishment of a Victims Commissioner for Scotland. An independent review of the Victim Notification Scheme is underway to ensure it is serving victims effectively, and we are committed to creating restorative justice services and using the use of victim impact statements in court. And the Victims Task Force, co-chaired by myself and the Lord Advocate, is directly informed by victims' voices and is progressing work to develop a more victim-centred and trauma-informed justice system. Stephen Kerr. A couple of weeks ago, a man was sentenced to three years in prison for repeatedly threatening to kill me and my wife. On one of the many times he was arrested, he was in the next street, two minutes from our front doorstep, and I pay tribute to the officers of Police Scotland for their actions in apprehending him. Presiding officer, even though the man has been to court, has had sentencing deferred for background reports, and has now been sentenced, to this date, not once has anyone in the criminal justice system reached out to me or my wife. In fact, it was through a colleague in this parliament that I learned that the man had appeared in court because my colleague had read it in a newspaper. What truly worries me is that there are so many of our constituents 
who have had the same experience and not known where to turn for help. So will the Cabinet Secretary agree to giving proper consideration to supporting my colleague Jamie Green's Victims Bill, which will put victims at the centre of the justice system where they rightly belong? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I first of all sympathise uh, with the experience which the member has had? I had a very similar experience myself with my uh, family being threatened with having the house burnt down by somebody who was subsequently convicted for burning down a house. And I know how troubling that can be. And I would also concede the point that there's not enough being done to make sure the victims of, in this case, a threat uh, is acknowledged by uh, the criminal justice system in its various forms. And we are trying to make sure that that is recognised right the way through uh, the whole criminal justice system. And it's worth acknowledging it's not necessarily a, a system in that sense. It has lots of independent parts to it. And some of what Stephen Kerr raises does relate, of course, to the court service and to the fiscal service. But what he said will be heard, I'm sure, by them. On the matter of supporting Jamie Green's bill, I was told this would come forward in the first 100 days of this parliament. I have not seen the bill yet. So I don't know how I can be expected to say I will support a bill until I see the provisions of it. From what I do know of it, and from previous discussions, much of it is covered by activity the government's already undertaking. But I re restate my commitment to say we will look at it uh, in good faith and see if there are things that we can work with when it comes forward. And supplementary, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And, and can I acknowledge the experiences articulated by Stephen Kerr and the Cabinet Secretary? Uh, the Scottish Government has stated it will introduce pioneering new restorative justice services through the launch of the restorative justice hubs. And this has been welcomed by stakeholders. And I wonder whether the Cabinet Secretary shares my view that it represents a really critical step towards putting victims at the heart of the justice system. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I very much do welcome that, and I think it does relate to the previous point by, made by Stephen Kerr as well, that the justice system has to be more about a, a, a judicial process and a finding of guilt or innocence at the end of it, if it's to mean meaningful justice to those that come up against the justice system. So I very much welcome the launch of these pioneering hubs, paving the way for restorative justice services being rolled out across Scotland. I was delighted yesterday to meet with staff and hear from survivors yesterday. And I know there are groups, including women's groups, that have real concerns, uh, although generally being supportive of these restorative hubs. But it's clear to me from talking to the survivors the way in which this could potentially meet a real need for those that have been victims uh, but want to, or, or survivors of, in particular, sexual assault uh, and rape, of having a more meaningful justice outcome at the end of it, although it can only ever be undertaken with the consent uh, and the active support of those who are victims and survivors. Question number three, Paul McLennan. To ask the Scottish Government what role local authority scrutiny will have in relation to the recently published consultation document on police complaints, investigations and misconduct legislation. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, each local authority has established individual scrutiny arrangements to align with local requirements, and I commend the work of local scrutiny committees and the work they have undertaken with Police Scotland to review arrangements in line with Dame Ailish's recommendations. The public consultation on police complaints, investigations and misconduct launched on the 24th of May, beginning our 12-week public consultation period, where we welcome views on our plans for future legislation. And the Government has invited local authorities via COSLA to discuss our plans for legislative change in December 2021. And again, following the launch of the consultation, we are keen to engage with local authorities directly to hear their views. Paul McLennan. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer? As he said, local authorities have various scrutiny bodies and arrangements in place throughout Scotland. Can I ask how local authority and regional feedback on issues will be addressed in the response of the specific regional or local authority I suppose, issues at that time? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's vital that the needs of local communities are understood and reflected in the planning and delivery of police services. So the SPA, the Scottish Police Authority, engages local authorities, COSLA and local policing teams to understand how policing is delivered locally. COSLA, Police Scotland and the SPA recently completed a review of the local police planning process and the revised joint approach was approved by COSLA and presented to SPA in March 2022 and work has begun to progress implementation. These local police plans are developed by Police Scotland's local area and divisional commanders who engage with local authorities and I am happy to ask the Chief Constable to write to the member on the specifics of this case. And supplementary, Russell Finlay. Thank you, Deputy President. Also. A female officer's career destroyed by a boys' club culture, a disgraceful Rangers malicious prosecution scandal, senior officers quitting to dodge investigation, over seven years to learn how a man died on a Fife Street. So when 
is the consultation expected to fix the SNP's broken police complaints system? Cabinet Secretary, I, I, I do appreciate that, that, that there was a focus on the role of local authority scrutiny, but uh, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could nonetheless, given the seriousness of the issue, respond. But it wasn't directly a supplementary question, so if the Cabinet Secretary wouldn't mind just responding on this occasion, thank you. Uh, just to say, none of the cases, I think, bear on the substantive question, which was about local authority scrutiny of local policing plans, but I'm happy if the member wants to raise it with me again to respond to him directly. Could we have less sedentary commentary? I'm in the chair. I've decided it wasn't relevant to this, the overarching substantive question, and that has become a feature in recent weeks. There are ways to link a question to make it a supplementary question. That did not meet the mark, but the Cabinet Secretary has indicated he will respond to the member in writing. Question number four, Pam Gozo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I ask the Scottish Government how many Police Scotland officers have retired in this financial year? Cabinet Secretary. Police Scotland have informed me that there have been 169 police officers of various ranks who have retired from Police Scotland between the 1st of April 2022 and the 26th of May 2022. A further 265 police officers have intimated their intention to retire before the 30th of June 2022. Therefore, Police Scotland expect a total of 434 police officers to have retired at the end of quarter one of this financial year. Pam Gozo. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Presiding officer. There are fewer than 17,000 officers in Police Scotland for the first time ever. It is suggested that one in ten officers are considering leaving Police Scotland after the introduction of the pension arrangements. The recent pay offer has been branded disgraceful, and the General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation says that spending review will be flat cash for police and officer numbers will plummet. Cabinet Secretary. What action will the Scottish Government take to prevent a mass exodus of police officers biding their time until retirement? Cabinet Secretary. It is really hard to know where to begin with a question like that. So it is just simply not the case that there have, been less, there have never been less than 17,000 police officers uh, before in Scotland. Uh, it is also true to say that the pay rise which was uh, awarded this year from the Scottish Government was matched by uh, a UK pay offer of zero, no pay increase last year. It is also true to say that we have substantially more officers per head in Scotland, that police officers start in Police Scotland on a salary of £5,000 per year more than they do in England and Wales. So the idea that Conservatives should be lecturing this Government on properly funding Police Scotland is a bit rich. And I think it is also true to say that we have seen the, the results of that investment in Police Scotland over the years, where we have some of the lowest crime levels, certainly lower than in England and Wales, but some of the lowest crime levels we have seen since 1974. So of course we want to continue to prioritise policing. We will do so against the back end of a 5.2 2 per cent cut from the UK Government. And wouldn't it be useful if, for once, the Conservatives could congratulate the police officers of Scotland on the work they do and talk to their own bosses in London to improve the grant to this Parliament so that we can look after our police officers and, indeed, all our public services? But I don't hold my breath waiting for that to happen. Supplementary, Emma Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland has significantly more police than elsewhere in the UK. Statistics from the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey have shown that around one in eight adults in Scotland experienced crime in 2019-20, compared to one in five in 08-09, a rate that remains lower than England and Wales, with an equivalent figure of 13.3%. So, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that while the Tories talk tough on justice matters, it is the SNP who are trusted to tackle crime and protect communities, which is why we were resoundingly re-elected little over a year ago? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I absolutely agree, and it is interesting that whenever we point out the differences between Scotland and the rest of the UK, how animated the Conservative bench has become, I wonder why that may be, it may be a degree of embarrassment. But I absolutely agree with the member. Scotland is a safer country since this SNP government took office. Recorded crime remains at one of the lowest levels since 1974, and is down 41% since 2006 7 yet to hear any recognition of that from the Conservatives. And as the member rightly points out, there are some 32 officers per 10,000 population in Scotland compared to around 23 in England and Wales. More generally, we are investing an additional £188 million across the justice system in 2022-23. This is more than three times what the Conservatives asked for. So we are looking after Police Scotland will continue to try to do so in a very difficult budgetary situation. And supplementary, Pauline McNeill. 
To summarise a letter from Police Scotland to the Criminal Justice Committee about the impact of recent changes to pension computation, they say it could result in up to 1,300 or police officers who could take advantage of those changes. I know the Cabinet Secretary is aware of this. But is the Cabinet Secretary also aware that the Scottish Police Federation is saying explicitly that is not the reason that so many police officers plan to leave? They say that their members are overworked, undervalued, and the constant disruption of rest days and cancellation of annual leave is taking an annual toll, is taking a toll on them physically and mentally. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would acknowledge that he is aware of this letter. And surely this is the most critical issue facing the police service now. Well, I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what are you thinking about doing to address this? Cabinet Secretary. I think what we have to do is try and ensure that we provide the resources to Police Scotland. Of course, some of the things which Paul McNeill talks about are not within the gift of the government to change. These are dealt with op operational decisions for uh, the Chief Constable, and it's right that they should do that. And I don't know if anybody is suggesting that we should change that so that the government becomes directly involved. I don't think that would be a good idea. But it's also true to say that we have, to, uh, we have had a situation with retirement. I've spoken to the Police Federation, I've spoken to the SPA, I've spoken to the Chief Constable, and top of the list is the retirement caused by the particular change in pensions that underlies the, the figures which I just gave. But of course, we have an interest in the well-being of police officers. We'll continue to talk to the Scottish Police Federation and do whatever we can to make sure uh, services and resources are provided to look after our police officers. Question number five, Pam Duncan Glancy. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Justice Secretary or Community Safety Minister have had with ministerial colleagues regarding action to ensure the safety of women attending abortion clinics in Glasgow. Minister Ash uh, The Cabinet Secretary and I are kept up to date on the discussions held in the Buffer Zones Working Group. Um, this is chaired by the Minister for Public Health, Women's Health and Sport. And we will make the Chief Constable aware of issues that have been raised when they next meet. Uh, the right to peaceful public assembly and freedom of expression are rights that we are committed to uphold, but these should never be used to promote hatred or justify intimidating or otherwise criminal behaviour. Um, but of course, operational policing decisions are a matter for Police Scotland, and decision making on appropriate action to safeguard public safety is a matter for them. Pam Duncan -Glancy. I thank the Minister for that answer. Whilst the Government fails to take direct action, women are being victimised when they should be receiving support. Protests are not just undermining patients, but are undermining staff too. We have heard the Government say that they are supportive of buffer zones, and we have heard the First Minister say protesters should protest outside Parliament, not medical settings, but women are still being harassed. So can I ask the Minister what conversations the Government is having with COSLA about how local authorities can be supported to introduce laws, and what discussions are happening with Police Scotland on the action they are able to take to protect women. Minister. Um, I thank the member for that question. It's some very important points that um, she's raised, and I am very sympathetic to uh, the intention behind the question. So on um, the recent um, incidents that we've seen at the Santa Ford Clinic, I'd just like to confirm for the member that Police Scotland were called um, on both occasions when the protest took place, and the police asked the protesters to stop using voice amplification devices and took formal statements as well from members of staff. Police Scotland, of course, have existing powers available to them to deal with any disorder or criminality that is arising from the protest. And the Scottish Government has been clear that the intimidation and the harassment of women as they access healthcare is completely unacceptable. And I know Scottish Government officials have already made Police Scotland aware of concerns that have been raised with them, and in particular the concerning reports about the protests that we have seen at Sandyford. And I know that Police Scotland have taken statements with regard to what went on there. Um, the Women's Health Minister, Marie Todd, um, of course, has convened a working group with partners such as COSLA, Police Scotland and affected councils and health boards to look at how to address uh, vigils and protests that take place outside abortion clinics. And I will commit to keeping the member updated on progress. Question number six, not lodged. Question number seven, Rhoda Grant, who is joining us remotely. Ms Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to end sexual exploitation in Scotland. Minister. Commercial sexual exploitation is recognised as a form of gendered violence within Equally Safe, Scotland's strategy for pre preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls. And as part of the delivery of the strategy, 
The Scottish Government supports a range of measures, including the provision of over £400,000 through the Delivering Equally Safe Fund, and that is to address commercial sexual exploitation and support those that are affected. And in addition, our Victim-Centred Approach Fund provides TARA project with £622,000 to support women trafficked for this purpose. And in addition, we are progressing the programme for government commitment to develop a model for Scotland which effectively tackles and challenges men's demand for prostitution. Rhoda Grant. It's still permissible to buy sex in Scotland while we do recognise that it is gendered violence. And this is feeding demand for trafficking. And we know there's people actively trying to traffic Iranian women and children to Scotland because they know those fleeing from war situations are very vulnerable. Can I therefore ask if there is a time frame for the implementation of a model for Scotland in order to close this loophole and, and allow those that, that allows those exploiters to operate in their midst? Minister. Um, I thank the member for raising this, what is a very important issue. And I would say to the member um, that the Scottish Government obviously has at the moment uh, a multi-agency group which is continuing to work and to make as much progress as possible on the topic of commercial sexual, sexual exploitation. Because as the member has outlined, uh, there are some things that are, that are going on at the moment. Um, I would say to the member that um, I am committed to progressing work on this agenda. As the member will know, there is much work that is going on behind the scenes here. I'm unfortunately not able to confirm for the member today what the time frame on um, the issue that the member has raised, but I commit to keeping the member updated on that work. And question number eight, uh, Sandish Gohani. And Dr Gohani, I hope, is joining us. Dr Gohani, please go ahead. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what data it collects on any difficulties faced by veterans in Scotland, including on the prevalence of mental health issues and drug and alcohol abuse. Cabinet Secretary. Improving veterans' data continues to be a priority for the Scottish Government. The member will be aware that Scotland's Census 2022 included for the first time a question on previous service with the armed forces. We have also identified additional sources of regular data collection, for example, by including the same question in the Scottish Household and Health Surveys. In addition, there is a veterans marker in the new Drug and Alcohol Information System, a national database which shows data relating to specialist drug and alcohol treatment from services across Scotland. Thank you for the answer, though it does seem that the new census is £150 million over budget and also uh, might not provide us with the information we need. And it's also clear there's a lack of data relating to specific issues for veterans. And without such data, we cannot fully understand and provide the correct help for veterans. And in view of the need for this data, what steps will the Scottish Government take to ensure that future statistical releases include specific data on issues for veterans, such as mental health waiting times, so that we can more accurately assess the scale of these problems? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've mentioned the steps that we're taking. I should say I have tried for years, over a decade, to get information from the UK Government on veterans, and it's been refused at virtually every turn. So perhaps if the member could have a word with his colleagues in the MOD and ask them to help provide data about veterans in Scotland, that would be helpful. I've mentioned how we can get information in relation to the census. I've mentioned how we can get relation into what's called DAISY in terms of addiction services. And it's also true to say that we are publishing um, we have published the Mental Health Action Plan, which will establish the network through the Implementation Board, which has been mentioned previously, which will have on it representatives from the Scottish Veterans Care Network. So that and all the different veterans organisations that we deal with can, of course, help us to get a more rounded picture of the needs of veterans across Scotland. And supplementary, Graeme Day. Uh, many thanks, President Officer. In March of this year, services that provide mental health support to Armed Forces veterans were given a very important funding boost when the Scottish Government announced £1.4 million for combat stress and a further £666,000 uh, for uh, Veterans First Point. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what improvements the Government expects to see uh, to the lives and experiences of our veterans as a result of this funding? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would acknowledge that uh, the ex uh, improvements in the lives and experience of veterans, uh, not released because of the funding which was mentioned previously, is substantially down to the work that Graham Day carried out as Veterans uh, Minister. 
that the funding ensures that Scotland's veterans can access appropriate support, and it includes funding for specialist veteran peer support workers who understand the experiences of those who have served and ensures veterans and their families are directed to the help that they need when they need it. We are also providing funding to support the implementation of the Veterans Mental Health and Wellbeing Action Plan, including the recently announced £50,000 for the CME campaign, which will challenge mental health stigma and discrimination experienced by veterans and hopefully change attitudes and behaviours so that veterans with experience of mental health problems are respected, valued and empowered. And I expect these developments to deliver significant improvements to the lives and experiences of veterans in Scotland. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on justice and veterans. And uh, there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item, being portfolio questions on finance and the economy, to allow front bench teams to move positions should they wish. Thank you. Okay, the next portfolio is finance and the economy. If a member wishes to ask a supplementary question, uh, they should press their request to speak button during the relevant uh, question or pressing an R in the chat function if they're joining us remotely. And I call question number one, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I remind members of my register of interests? Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions finance ministers have had with ministerial colleagues regarding support for the Grangemouth refinery, including any future investment. Minister Richard uh, Lockhead. Through the Grangemouth Future Industry Boards, the Scottish Government and partners have initiated work to develop a just transition plan for the wider Grangemouth industrial complex, of which the refinery is an integral part. As we work to understand how to deliver a just transition for the whole of the country, ministers will, as you would expect, engage with ministerial uh, finance colleagues as appropriate. In line with the principles of a just transition, this plan for the Grangemouth complex will be built collectively in consultation with a wide range of the stakeholders, including industry. And the just transition plan will outline an ambitious and clearly defined vision, identifying and providing evidence for a specific activity that will form an action plan to support its realisation. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Uh, just two weeks ago, I met with Unite Trade Union representatives in Grangemouth. Speculation about PetroChina withdrawing its 50 per cent stake from the refinery is causing anxiety, unrest and uncertainty among the workforce. The Grangemouth refinery may, remains a vital strategic national asset. It provides security of supply and in previous quarters, the site has generated as much as 10 per cent of Scotland's total gross domestic product. And yet we know, and the workforce knows, that its fate lies in the hands of a billionaire tax exile and an overseas-owned corporation. SNP government ministers, including first ministers, have intervened previously with INEOS. Will the present government and the present first minister intervene and hold urgent discussions with INEOS, PetroChina, and unite the union about the future, the long-term future of the site, future jobs, future investment, future diversification, future decarbonisation and future ownership. Minister Richard Lockhead. Uh, ministers would, of course, uh, agree with the members' assessment of the importance of the asset to, to Scotland and its strategic importance, as well as importance in terms of maintaining local jobs. Um, I'm sure the member will understand that I can't comment on, on media speculation, but he did mention Unite the Union, who have been, of course, in contact with uh, Scottish ministers. And I know my colleague Michael Mathis and the Cabinet Secretary for uh, Net Zero Transport and Energy has uh, responded to that letter on behalf of the, the Scottish Government. And I just want to assure uh, Richard Leonard and members that we are in regular contact. There is regular ministerial contact with the operators of the refinery, uh, and no doubt that is continuing uh, in the coming weeks and months. 
Uh, and we very much recognise the importance of also through the, uh, the industrial board I mentioned with the just transition aspect of this will be addressed that of course the creation and maintenance of good green jobs is very important for the future of the whole site uh, as well. Question number two, Liz Smith. To ask the Scottish Government what lessons can be learnt from Reform Scotland's recent publication about the future of the Scottish National Investment Bank. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I put on record at the outset my appreciation for um, all Reform Scotland uh, reports. I think they play an important role in widening the debate, and we certainly welcome uh, that particular paper and support its aim in stimulating debate on the future activities of the bank. Of course, the bank is essentially a start-up. It's had uh, 18 months, and in that period, it's built an operational structure from scratch. It's recruited over 50 staff. It's delivered investment commitments of over £200 million to 16 projects across all three of their missions, leveraging over £450 million of additional private funding. And I think by any standard, that is pretty remarkable for a start-up. While very supportive of the principles of the Scottish National Investment Bank, Professor Ross Brown said that the bank is, and I quote, shackled, its mission is vague, and its impact limited, concluding that the current strategy is ineffective for a publicly owned bank. Can I ask what the Cabinet Secretary is going to do to address this? Well, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, the bank is on a journey. It's already putting more focus, for example, on origination and enabling scale-up. It's working currently to obtain FCA status, which will enable it to leverage in further private investment. Critically, it is operationally independent of ministers, and I think that is hugely important and needs to be protected. And if you look at the list of investments that it's already made, from uh, Aberdeen to Edinburgh, uh, it demonstrates a, a range of investments which all align with uh, those missions. A couple of supplementaries. First, uh, Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In, in yesterday's uh, 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 spending review, the profile of investment for the National Investment Bank was falling to 9 million through to 1 million in 25 26 to 0 in 26 27. That will leave the investment that's already gone into the investment bank at 610 million, I believe. I just would be grateful for the Cabinet Secretary to clarify what the protected capitalisation will be as a result of the spending review, because on my analysis, and I'm happy to be corrected, that's well short of the two billion uh, that was promised. And what will the impact be on the number of projects and the value of those projects that the investment bank will be able to invest in? Cabinet Secretary. Forgive me if I misunderstood. I think the member was quoting the figures for the operational resource requirements of the bank. And of course, the bank is on a journey to be self sustainable. So we're committed on the capital side to capitalising the bank with £2 billion. Uh, and I think in the targeted capital spending review, you will see that trajectory which honours our commitment to that £2 billion worth of uh, capitalisation. What he's referring to, as I understand it, if I heard the £9 million figure correctly, is the operational costs, the resource costs, and of course the bank has an aim there to ultimately become self-sustaining and to leverage in private sector investment to increase the overall investment of that £2 billion. Further supplementary, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. As we know, the Scottish National Investment Bank is focused on long-term missions to deliver a range of environmental, social and economic returns. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information on the bank's latest investments and how these will fit with its missions to achieve a just transition to net zero carbon emissions by 2045. Well, one of the many investments that the bank has made is a £9 million investment in Circularity Scotland. That is a not-for-profit uh, company responsible for delivering Scotland's deposit return scheme. And that investment leveraged in £9 million in additional private finance, again demonstrating the role the bank has in using public sector funding to leverage in private uh, sector finance. Also, the recent £30 million investment into the expansion of Aberdeen Harbour will increase uh, land and water access to offshore wind developers and clearly strengthen Aberdeen's position as a key port hub for our large-scale energy transition effort. Those are just two examples of many. Thank you. Question number three, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the rollout of superfast broadband. Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, in terms of the rollout of superfast broadband, the member is aware of our commitment to uh, reach 100% uh, of properties. Latest Ofcom figures show over 2.6 million homes and businesses across Scotland can access superfast broadband speeds of 30 megabits per second and above. And it's worth uh, reminding the Chamber and the member that telecoms is entirely reserved to Westminster. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the response. With the R100 rollout being delayed from 2021 to 2027, uh, the Scottish Government have a long way to go to convince communities. The voucher, scheme, the voucher scheme for R100 has also been disappointing in the extreme, Cabinet Secretary, with only 497 households applying in my region compared to the over 41,000 households that are eligible. How can the Scottish Government address these con connectivity problems when they are clearly failing communities the length and breadth of the country? Cabinet what Secretary. I think communities are convinced by is if they waited for the UK Government to reach them, they would be waiting an awful long time. As of the 30th of April 2022, over 9,600 connections have been delivered through the R100 contracts and vouchers, the majority of which are full fibre, with a further 9,500 connections in build. And uh, I, I wait to see what the UK government will do in terms of connecting any of these households. Thank you. And supplementary from Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government have made substantial progress in improving digital connectivity in Scotland, despite the fact that telecommunications is a matter wholly reserved to Westminster. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information about steps which the Scottish Government is taking to encourage the rollout of 5G in Scotland? Before you well, answer, I Cabinet Secretary, could I please encourage um, those on the Tory benches to uh, listen to the question and listen to the answers without making interventions from a sedentary position? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I will start by reminding the Chamber that broadband and telecoms is 100 per cent reserved. Um, in Scotland, 5G rollout is commercially led, but we've taken a series of actions designed to try and create the conditions where mobile network operators can roll out 5G infrastructure um, a lot more easily. And that includes changes to planning legislation. It includes our innovative Infralink project to, um, to help with site rental guidance. Um, and we've acted on input from a wide range of stakeholders, including the mobile industry and other partners in the public sector, to try and progress that as quickly as possible. And the last and most important point in this regard is the £28.75 million Scottish 4G infill programme, which tries to ensure that there are future-proof masks in areas that would not have masks through a commercial build. Again, all of that funding is from our own budget because we aren't willing to wait for the UK government to fund it. Question number four, Claire Baker. Um, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is responding to the findings of the evaluation of the small business bonus scheme that it commissioned, which was carried out by the Fraser of Allender Institute. Minister Tom Arthur. We welcome the Fraser of Allender's report and the work they carried out and have been considering the contents of the report carefully. We are convening a short-term working group which will help inform our consideration of the recommendations in full. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for his response. It is important to note that the report also found that there was no empirical evidence that identifies the Small Business Bonus Scheme as supporting enhanced business outcomes. Businesses perceive there to be benefits, but that is not the same as evidencing that there are benefits. This is not least because the limitations on available data, which are highlighted in the report, makes evaluation challenging, with problems identifying businesses, turnover in employment and investment, as well as inconsistency in data collection and management. So, will the Scottish Government commit to regular and comprehensive assessments of the Small Business Bonus Scheme and other business support policies, and to take a more thorough and standardised approach to data collection, which would allow comparison with other business support schemes? Minister Tom Arthur. I am grateful to uh, Ms Baker for her supplementary. Uh, just for clarity, and I think this was implicit in um, Ms Baker's supplementary, the, the Fraser Valder Institute did not say that the scheme has no effect, but VARA highlighted that data limitations have limited Fraser Valander Institute in evidencing that there is effect. And I think when we speak to small businesses, we recognise the importance. To quote the FSB, uh, Scotty, uh, the small business bonus scheme, and I quote the FSB are here, has been a lifeline for many firms. So if members are, I find that funny, that's up to them. And I would reiterate that this government has committed um, 
to the Small Business Border Scheme, and indeed, including all NDR reliefs this year, it totals in an estimated £802 million. What I will say is with the Short Life Working Group that we are establishing, we have invited representatives from a range of business organisations, including local authorities, and we hope to convene the first meeting shortly. And on that particular issue of data in relation to the Small Business Bonus Scheme, that will be a priority and a particular concern to the Short Life Working Group. Supplementary Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. It is vital that we use every lever at our disposal to respond to the climate emergency. Can the Minister provide an update as to the steps which the Scottish Government is taking through rates relief to help us to reach our net zero ambitions? Thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government provides a generous and comprehensive non-domestic rate relief package to support net zero ambitions. We provide up to 100 per cent renewable energy relief for subjects that are used for the purpose of the generation of heat or power, where the scheme also provides community benefit. Small-scale hydro schemes are eligible for 60 per cent relief, which has been guaranteed to March 2032. In April, we expanded the Business Growth Accelerator relief to include the installation of solar panels as a qualifying improvement eligible for relief. This provides no increase, uh, rates increase for 12 months after a qualifying property improvement. We have also increased the relief for new district heating networks powered by renewable energy to 90 per cent from 1 April 2021. Thank you. Question number five has been withdrawn. Question number six, Donald Cameron. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how much additional funding it has allocated to the national records of Scotland. Minister Tom Arthur. Today, no additional funding has been allocated. Additional funding will be considered during the budget revision process and will be based on the actual additional costs incurred. Donald Cameron. The NRS is, of course, uh, the body responsible for the census. Uh, as a result of the SNP's decision to delay that by a year, as well as the recent extension to the end of May, that census has not only failed to reach its 94 per cent uptake target, but it has cost taxpayers £30 million more than it needed to. Given this phenomenal waste of taxpayers' money, will the Minister make a commitment today that the next census will take place in sync with the rest of the UK to prevent this costly shambles ever happening again? Minister Tom Arthur. Well, can I say to Mr Cameron, I take it as a vote of confidence that he thinks I will still be a minister in 10 years' time when the next census occurs. Um, decisions around the timing of the census will be taken, of course, at the appropriate moment. And in relation to the substance of the question, the particular points he raises regarding funding will, of course, be confirmed through the usual processes. Question number seven is Martin Whitfield. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what assessment the Finance Secretary has made of any impact on Scotland's financial outlook as a result of the reduction to ScotRail services. Minister Tom Arthur. Presiding Officer, is, there is no doubt that the current temporary timetable is causing significant inconvenience and frustration to travellers, especially people to, who, to people who need early and late services to get to and from work, and those sectors and businesses in the economy that depend on people being able to travel in the evenings. We are engaging with stakeholders and sectors that may be affected by disruption to services and will continue to do so in the coming weeks. The latest transport trends show a downturn in travel by rail compared to previous weeks, but they are also showing a slight uplift in concessionary bus travel, which is welcome. But the sooner we can get back to a full timetable, the better it will be for passengers, for businesses and, of course, for employees too. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful for that answer. The well-respected economist Tony Mackey said that due to the cuts to ScotRail, the estimated cost to the Scottish economy is between £75 million and £80 million every week. From the combination and the fall of economic output, the extra money that is being spent by travellers to get to their destinations. Does the Minister agree with this analysis? And after yesterday's announcement, will the Scottish Government hit reset to properly invest in our public transport and economy? Minister Tom Arthur. Um, I note with interest uh, Professor Tony Mackay's comments. We have given them some consideration, as the member would expect. We are, however, aware that the estimates were produced rapidly and, crucially, before the revised timetable was introduced. We are monitoring the situation and, as I say, we are engaging with stakeholders to un understand the impacts on their sectors. Supplementary, Jamie Hawker johnson uh, thank you. Just over a week ago, Richard Lockhart told the BBC's Sunday show that he hoped the ScotRail crisis would be sorted soon. But we've just learned in the last hour that ASLEF have re rejected ScotRail's pay offer, and rather than being sorted soon, the disruption being experienced by rail users across Scotland could get a lot worse. The Minister must be aware of the impact that that disruption is having across Scotland, but also in regions like mine, the Highlands and Islands, particularly at the start of the tourist season. 
So can I ask what, if any, regional analysis has been conducted on the econom economic impact this crisis is having on businesses and communities, and what support might be made available by this government? Minister Tomarta. Uh, as I said in, um, previously, Presiding Officer, we are engaging regularly with businesses, and any particular issue, issues that are identified by businesses, be they national or specific to a particular region, we will take that into account in considering how we respond. Question number eight, Miles Briggs. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how many green jobs have been supported since the introduction of the Green Jobs Fund. Minister Richard Lockhead. The Green Jobs Fund is a five-year, £100 million capital fund which will support businesses and their supply chains to help them better transition to a low-carbon economy. The support provided by the fund aims to create green employment through investment in equipment, premises, research and development. Between the enterprise agencies and Scottish ministers, 57 projects have been supported with grant funding of £16.8 million through the Green Jobs Fund. Figures provided by the recipients of these awards estimated this fund will support up to 3,886 jobs over the life of the individual projects. Miles Briggs. The Scottish Government had pledged 130,000 green jobs by 2020. Uh, the Office of National Statistics estimates that um, employment in the low carbon and renewable energy sector dropped from 21,700 uh, to 20,500 in 2020. That is the fourth consecutive year that we have seen a reduction in green jobs. What plans do ministers now have to bring forward a new and updated strategy alongside industry to make sure that we can realise the potential green jobs have both in the renewable energy sector but also the, the carbon neutral retrofitting sectors as well? Richard Lockhead. Uh, can I just say to Miles Briggs that Scotland is making significant progress in creating green jobs. Indeed, the PricewaterhouseCoopers Green Jobs Barometer, uh, the most recent one, shows that Scotland is the best performing part of the UK in terms of green jobs created, and with Scotland being well positioned to maximise the benefits of green investment. And the member did, of course, refer to the ONS definition of green jobs, which the ONS at the moment are looking at because they accept it is far from ideal. It is a very narrow definition of green jobs. So I am convinced there are many, many jobs being created uh, throughout Scotland in terms of green jobs uh, at the moment. And indeed, if you look at the Scottish Government's own policies, uh, the hydrogen policy statement, for instance, could create up to 300,000 green jobs in Scotland. The ACORN project, which the UK Government are not supporting, could have created 20,600 jobs if they had given the go-ahead, which they should have done to that. Our heat and building strategy, 16,400 green jobs potentially. Uh, renewables in the offshore wind prospectus, 17,000 jobs uh, hopefully uh, as well. So Scotland is in the course to create hundreds of thousands of green jobs in the coming years if we put our plans into practice and support them. And of course, where appropriate, have the UK Government support as well. So can I ask Mel Briggs to speak to UK colleagues and ask them to get behind the ACORN project and other projects reverse the decision and create even more green jobs for Scotland. And supplementary, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Creating and supporting green jobs through initiatives like the Green Jobs Fund and the Just Transition Fund for the North East and Murray will play a very important part in securing our transition to net zero. However, the Scottish Government's ambitions do not seem to be matched by the UK Government. Does the Minister agree that it is high time that the UK Government stepped up and committed to properly support a just transition, matching the Scottish Government's £500 million just transition fund? Minister Richard Lockhead. Uh, can I thank the member for the question, which gives me the opportunity to remind the Chamber that the first tranche of the Just Transition Fund for Murray and North East Scotland, which is £500 million over the next 10 years, opened for expressions of interest on Tuesday of this week, and if all members in the relevant parts of the country could uh, advertise that and help uh, make people aware of that, we would be very, very grateful uh, to help our, our transition towards uh, a net zero uh, economy. And, uh, Audrey Nichols is quite right, of course, the UK Government should play a much bigger role in this. After all, it has extracted hundreds of billions of pounds from the North Sea in terms of oil revenues. And if it were to match the £500 million commitment from the Scottish Government, that would go a long way to helping ensure we have a just transition in the north east of Scotland and Murray in the years ahead. And of course, I gave the example of the ACORN project, which would have created new jobs, thousands of new jobs from next year onwards, the best position project to get the go ahead in the UK, and the Conservative UK Government said no to that, causing a lot of anger in the industrial community in Scotland. So the UK Government, as Audrey Nicholl says, has a lot more they can do to match the Scottish Government's ambition for a just transition. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. That concludes uh, questions on finance. There will be a brief uh, pause while the front benches change. Okay, we move on to the final portfolio this afternoon. That's education and skills. If a member wishes to ask a supplementary question, as ever, they should press the request to speak button or place an R in the chat function during the relevant question. I call question number one, which is from Gillian Mackay, who joins us remotely. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Scottish Funding Council in light of the reported ongoing governance concerns outside Lanarkshire College. Cabinet Secretary. I meet regularly with the Scottish Funding Council and they continue to provide me with the assurance that due process is being followed and arrangements are in place to secure good governance, sound leadership and positive outcomes for the students of the College. Dylan Mackay. Minutes from meetings of the College Board of Management refer to allegations of systematic bullying and intimidation of a number of staff and potential financial irregularities. They also show that SLC failed to comply with the Code of Good Governance. What steps is the Scottish Government taking to resolve these ongoing issues with South Lanarkshire College and to address the concerns that EIS FILA have raised around the governance structure? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Funding Council, as a responsible organisation for overseeing any investigation of these matters, acted immediately to understand and stabilise the situation. The Funding Council commissioned an independent review of governance and relationships at the College in order to establish the nature of the issues being raised and what further action, if any, was required. The College has published an action plan to address the key findings and recommendations in relation to governance improvements, including complaints handling and relationships stemming from that review. The regional strategic body is responsible for investigating complaints of the nature the member refers to in her question. Investigations into these complaints remain ongoing and the Funding Council continues to seek regular assurances from the regional strategic body that these are progressing in an appropriate manner. The Funding Council will continue to keep the Scottish Government updated on progress. Minister's paramount consideration is the safeguarding of the quality of learning at South Lanarkshire College and a high standards are crucial to ensure this. Supplementary, Graham Simpson. Thank you. What's been going on at South Lanarkshire College is a scandal. We have allegations of private businesses operating from college premises, using college materials and lecturing staff time. A new principal, Aileen McKechnie, was, in my view, cleaning up the mess. She was suspended and she should be reinstated. The local EIS Feller branch had a vote of no confidence in the board. I was at a branch meeting last week and it was announced that the national executive is backing the branch on that. It's quite unprecedented. Now, much of this was allegedly happening while the head of HR at the college was Kirsten Oswald, now the MP for East Renfrewshire. And people have told me that Kirsten Oswald knew what was going on. So has the Cabinet Secretary had any discussions with Kirsten Oswald about this? And would she agree with me that as a public figure, Kirsten Oswald should say what she knew and whether she was asked to do anything? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I understand and appreciate that members will have concerns um, over the um, issues um, at the College. Can I urge caution when we uh, decide in this chamber to name individuals and to cast aspersions on them, particularly while there is due process uh, ongoing at the College? I said in my answer to Gillian Mackay that there are uh, a number um, of investigations that continue to be ongoing. I think it is very important that as a government minister I do not prejudice those. Uh, he did point to the fact um, the member did point to the, the, the fact um, that uh, the principal has uh, been suspended. That was uh, a decision um, for the board, not for the Scottish Government. This was, uh, as the board chose to do, part of the due process that would uh, allow the investigations to carry in place. And the principal and interim board clerk 
uh, were suspended without prejudice. Uh, I would say uh, again to the member, uh, I do take these accusations at the College very seriously. Uh, I am in regular discussion with the Funding Council to, re to receive reassurances about those but we have investigations ongoing. There is an official process, and I think it's important that members uh, take sight of that, uh, give that the, the importance and significance that I think it deserves, and uh, no doubt it will conclude in due time. Question number two, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it's monitoring and tracking the outcomes of the rollout of school councillors. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Local authorities provide six monthly reports to the Scottish Government on the impact and effectiveness of school councillors. A summary of the reports is published on the Scottish Government website. Officials are also working closely with councillor coordinators network to ensure ongoing engagement with education authorities on the provision of school councillors. School counselling is just one of a range of services that schools may have in place to support health, emotional and social needs of children and young people. Gillian Martin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Additional funding has been delivered by the Scottish Government to local authorities for school councillor provision. And post-pandemic, this early intervention tool was needed more than ever. This has been borne out by many of the witnesses that Health, Social Care and Sport Committee had when we did our uh, inquiry into the health and well-being of children and young people. Um, does, the minister, uh, does the Cabinet Secretary rather, have a sense that councillors are all now in place Scotland-wide? and that there is a consistency in the training and job descriptions they have across all 32 local authorities. Cabinet Secretary. So all local authorities have confirmed counselling services are in place across Scotland. There is a variation in how the services um, are being delivered. For example, some authorities are providing a specific resource in schools, while others are providing an authority-wide service according to the needs across the region. The guidance is clear that counselling support provided should conform to agreed professional standards provided by a professional counselling body. And the guidance also makes clear that education authorities are responsible for establishing the way in which their services work, which includes training, recruitment and employment of school counsellors. Supplementary, Stephen Kerr. Deputy President, officer, this is a question as much as anything else about monitoring tracking outcomes. And Audit Scotland has repeatedly made it clear that the Scottish Government performance in monitoring and tracking outcomes is dismal. So when will the Scottish Government publish the measurement of the outcomes of the £1 billion that's already been spent on the attainment gap funding? Cabinet Secretary. I'm uh, not entirely sure uh, what that has to do with the rollout of councillors, which is, of course, funded in an entirely different manner, and which the outcomes of which uh, I uh, provided information to how that is reported in my original answer. Uh, Mr Kerr will be well aware that uh, the responsibility for the uh, delivery of uh, the Attainment Challenge funding is not just a matter for national government, but also for local government. We measure this um, in a number of ways through ASO statistics and through the information that's in the National Improvement Framework uh, and the work that on, is ongoing to gather uh, data. Uh, there is more data that is gathered in education now than in previous years. That's exactly because the Scottish Government wants to see uh, the outcomes uh, that are being delivered through not only the billion pounds worth of attainment funding, uh, which I thank Mr Kerr for raising to the Chamber, also the additional 2,000 teachers that that we see when compared to pre-pandemic levels in our schools across Scotland. Thank you. Mr Kerr, given that the supplementary was tangential to the original question, I would not be shouting from a sedentary position uh, if I were you. Question number three, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the condition of school buildings. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Buildings across Scotland are in their best condition since recorded figures began. The proportion of schools in good or satisfactory condition has increased from 61% in April 2007 to 90.2% .2 in April 2021. Jackie Dunbar. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Modern, safe and innovative school buildings play a vital role in improving attainment and outcomes for school pupils. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the state of school buildings in Scotland compares with those of other UK nations? Cabinet Secretary. Well, although we cannot draw on direct like-for-like -like comparisons, I am aware from recent media reports that DfE officials are calling for further funding 
to increase the number of schools built due to the deteriorating condition. Indeed, uh, we received uh, information through the media that leaked UK government documents last week revealed that schools posed a risk to life. I would compare that to the work that is indeed ongoing within government and in our continued investment within schools through the £2 billion Learning Estate Investment Programme, which will benefit around 50,000 pupils across Scotland. Question number four, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support college and university students with the cost of living crisis. Minister Jamie Hepburn. I understand this is a tough time for many students who are facing higher energy bills and increased financial hardship as a consequence of the current cost of living crisis. Since June 2021, the Scottish Government has provided over £37 million of hardship funding to colleges and universities, support students facing financial hardship throughout the year, including over the summer months. Students in further higher education currently experiencing financial hardship should apply to the college or university for support from discretionary funds. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? Earlier this year, NUS Scotland warned that 54 per cent of students will find coping financially over the summer months difficult. They called it a cliff edge for students in relation to the cost of living, rent, food, utilities and essential travel. Twelve months ago, the Scottish Government committed to reviewing support for students over the summer months. When will that review be completed and will the Scottish Government put in place similar discretionary support as was available last summer? Minister Jamie Hepburn. It will, as I have already uh, laid out, the discretion funds that are in place are uh, available over uh, the summer. I, as the member would expect, meet with the National Union students on a regular basis. I have been able to discuss uh, these matters on the back of a previous uh, discussion with them that I wrote to all principals of colleges and universities to uh, and ask them to make sure that they were expending the remaining hardship funds that are uh, in place in uh, response to the cost of uh, living a crisis. That is still my expectation. In terms of uh, summer uh, support, we have uh, committed to undertaking uh, that uh, review. That work uh, is underway, and uh, I continue to take it forward and look forward to concluding it and reporting back to Parliament. Thank you. Supplementary. Co-Cap Stewart. Thank you. Um, last week, I met with representatives of uh, Glasgow University Student Representative Council in my constituency, who raised with me concerns about the levels of student hardship being experienced because of the cost of living crisis. I would like to ask the Scottish Government if it will consider working with universities and colleges to find ways of further mitigating student hardship as a matter of urgency. And will the Minister uh, meet, agree to meet with me to explore potential additional supports for students at this hugely distressing time. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, will Ms Stewart uh, ask me to consider working with universities and colleges to uh, uh, tackle the challenges that we face? I, I will not just consider doing it. I will continue uh, doing it in relation to the hardship funds that we distribute, uh, including the new international student hardship fund. I have already made the point about writing to principals to urge them to make sure they are using the funds uh, that they have in response to the cost of living uh, crisis will continue to work on our student accommodation strategy in tandem with universities and colleges, our student mental health action plan, uh, and uh, also the plans we have to enhance uh, student support more uh, generally. So I won't just be considering it, I will be doing it, and I will of course be happy to meet with CoCAP Stewart to discuss that further. Question number five, Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it plans to support the so-called COVID generation of young people who have not received full assessment at a school. Cabinet Secretary. Schools and colleges are best placed to provide the tailored support individual learners need. In response to COVID, Education Scotland has also put in place a package of support which included the National e-Learning Office offer with partners which supports teaching and learning by giving access to a wide range of live, recorded and supported resources. The Scottish Government also provided £4 million of funding to boost Easter study support locally, particularly for those from the most deprived backgrounds. In addition to significant course modifications and revision support, SQA will take a more generous approach to grading than in a normal exam year, and the appeals approach goes further than recent pre-pandemic years. These measures are expected to give learners affected by the pandemic the best chance to demonstrate their potential and receive the grades they deserve this year. Faisal Chowdhury. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. Uh, what plans has the Scottish Government got to carry out an independent review into the impact of COVID on education to identify gaps and lost learnings, to understand the challenges in an education recovery. 
how can they start to rebuild and combat the lost education if they don't know the losses suffered? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, uh, can I thank the member for the question, but can I urge caution about talking about this concept of lost learning? Because it's not only about the lost learning, but also about the health and well-being of our children and young people as well. And we need to see that holistic approach. Uh, when, uh, I'm afraid I would, however, disagree with the premise that we don't know about the impact um, of COVID. Uh, there was a uh, a number of documents that were published uh, during pandemic, including uh, an equality um, assessment, uh, and we have also, of course, recently uh, um, had the publication of the ASO statistics. Uh, we will again see those published um, um, following uh, months this year. Those are our key measurements that we had pre-pandemic, and we will continue to have um, post-pandemic to be able to analyse uh, the impact. Uh, ASO looks at uh, impacts around the lost learning, uh, but importantly, of course, the Scottish Government is also keen uh, to gather uh, data on a number of other issues around the health and well-being, which is why the health and well-being census is so important, so we can ensure we are aware of the wider impact of COVID. Question number six, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact real terms cuts to funding for further education are having on the college sector. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government is investing almost £2 billion in Scotland's colleges and universities in 2022-23, and the Scottish Foundation Council has worked hard to extend budget flexibility to colleges where possible to provide greater planning certainty. Our expectation is that colleges will prioritise spend within their allocations on the most impactful provision and skills alignment, consider wider economic and local community as well as learn our needs. Dean Lockhart. Uh, despite what the Minister has just said, the reality is that due to an 8 per cent real terms cut to its funding, Forth Valley College has taken the decision to close its Rapluch campus in Stirling, with the resulting loss of over 40 jobs. This decision by Forth Valley College, which will no doubt be replicated across Scotland as a result of severe funding cuts, proves once again that education and skills are nowhere near a priority for this SNP Scottish Government. What message does the Minister have for those who have lose their, uh, lost their jobs as a result of his funding cuts? Minister Jamie Hepburn. Well, let, let me say my understanding to the background of that decision is not that it was uh, driven by uh, financial considerations, but by uh, best utilisation of uh, the estate that the uh, college has, an excellent estate that the Scottish Government has invested in uh, over uh, the uh, years. Uh, what I would also uh, say to Mr Lockhart is that, uh, contrary to his assertion around funding for uh, the individual college, what we have actually been able to do in this the coming year has increased the total funding allocation for Forth Valley College. Their baseline teaching funding last year was £24.5 million. Uh, this year it will be £25.6 million, and that is in common with all colleges. So we are uh, doing uh, well. He says, is that a real terms cut? Let me remind Mr Lockhart, indeed all the Conservative benches, that their government at the UK level has delivered a 5.2 per cent real terms cut for this government. They don't like to be reminded of that, presiding officer. That's the reality, and that's the consequences of what we have to deal with. Yep. Got a number of supplementaries here. Firstly, Evelyn Tweet. Thanks, Deputy Presiding Officer. Instead of Dean Lockhart fighting with the Minister about the figures which the Minister has outlined, does the Minister agree that Mr Lockhart should lobby his colleagues in the Treasury to deliver a fair settlement for Scotland? Minister. Well, let me first of all uh, say I'm entirely relaxed about Mr Lockhart fighting with me. I appreciate Ms Tweed's concern for me, but I'll be able to cope with that. She doesn't need to worry about that. But I think she makes uh, a fair point. It re-emphasises the point I've just made in relation to the reduction, the real terms reduction in uh, spending leeway this uh, government has this year by comparison to last year. And I would uh, be delighted if Mr Lockhart would uh, make any uh, representations to his colleagues in the Treasury, but I don't hold my breath. Michael Mana. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I can assure the Minister I know that he's having these conversations as well with principals across Scotland and our colleges, that colleges across the land are facing cuts in terms of the number of staff that they can place as a result of the budgets that have been put in place this year. They have also received letters from the Scottish Funding Council asking them to do the same job that they did last year on all the same metrics with less money. 
Will he, first of all, give assurances that the, uh, there will not be the same regular clawback processes that the SFC put in place if targets are not met, given that budgets have been caught, uh, cut? And can he also speak to the SFC and ensure that actually there is a realistic conversation with colleges about what they can deliver on the basis of the budget that he has presented them with? Minister Jamie Hepburn. Well, uh, Mr Mara uh, is correct. Of course, I speak with colleges regularly. I am not suggesting for a moment that there are not tough uh, decisions for uh, college uh, principals, but he asks for uh, increased flexibilities for uh, colleges. That is already being built in this year by uh, the uh, SFC. For example, there is a 2 per cent tolerance threshold for uh, core uh, credit uh, targets. Colleges can claim additional credits uh, in the instances where personal learning support plans are in place to address the, the loss of learning uh, caused by the pandemic. Colleges will be offered additional discretion in delivering short courses to people who have been adversely affected by the pandemic. So we are building in additional flexibility. And I also meet with Colleges of Scotland and the SFC on a regular basis. And if we can go further, I will be delighted to do so. Kenny Gibson. Officer, can the Minister say how Scotland's college sector is faring compared to England's where following successive Labour coalition and Tory governments, the Institute for Fiscal Studies said, and I quote, the cuts to education spending in England over the last decade are effectively without precedent in post-war history? And does he share my surprise that Mr Lockhart seeks more money for the college sector when this year our resource budget has been cut by the UK Tory government by 5.2 per cent and our capital budget by 9.7 per cent? Minister. Well, I can't say I'm too surprised by Mr Lockhart's stance because it is entirely consistent with that of the Conservatives uh, in all debates and that they deny the reality of the real terms cut being delivered to this Government's budget by the, uh, their Government uh, down uh, in uh, uh, London. But uh, what I can say is uh, it was, of course, difficult to, to offer direct comparisons between college sectors. What I can say is that since 2008-2009, over 700,000 full-time college students have successfully completed their courses here in Scotland. And despite the pandemic, uh, nearly 85 per cent of college leavers in 2019-20 moved on to positive destinations. So that is a real uh, story of success for Scotland's colleges. And final supplementary, Stephen Kerr. Did the Minister undertake to speak to the principal of Forth Valley College before he makes any more public statements about why what uh, Dean Lockhart describes is happening? Minister Jamie Hepburn. I am happy to confirm I speak with the principal on a regular basis. Question number seven, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to review and address any university funding gap in light of reports of increasing numbers of international students being offered places compared with Scottish domiciled applicants. Minister Jamie Hepburn. International students and those from other parts of the UK are not eligible to access the funded places which have been protected for eligible Scottish and EU students. For 2022-23, we are providing over £1.1 billion to our universities to support their continued financial sustainability, overcome the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic and strengthen our economic recovery, including supporting our young people to gain the skills and knowledge they need to be successful. Paul McGregor. I yeah, thank the Minister for that response. Over the last couple of months, I have been contacted by several constituents who have been rejected from university courses despite exceptional grades. They tell me that the feedback that they are getting is that this is due to a lack of funded places. In one instance, a constituent from a local high school informed me that she achieved six A's and one B in her national five exams, in fifth year, four A's and one B, and was currently completing another two hires and also modules in law and mental health. She was also the school captain. Despite this, she found herself rejected for law at Strathclyde, Dundee and Edinburgh, and then declined from law and business at Edinburgh also. Fortunately, there is good news, my constituent did get another placement in the end, but there are similar stories. My concern here is that the message of su that such rejections for high-achieving high students can have in other pupils in deprived areas like Coatbridge. I do welcome the recent report from the Commissioner for Fair Access that Scotland is setting the pace in the UK, and we are way ahead of the other nations when it comes to students from deprived areas getting into university, something that the First Minister uh, reflected Question, on earlier. Please, Mr. McGregor. However, what more does the Minister think that universities can do to further widen this access and ensure that all our young people have an equal chance? Minister Jamie Hepburn. So, uh, what I can, of course, uh, first of all say is that uh, I'm uh, glad that, despite some of the challenges, uh, Mr. McGregor's uh, constituent has got a, a place at uh, university. Our institutions are highly regarded. The selection process for places in the most sought-after courses can be uh, extremely competitive. What I should say, going back to his original uh, question, is there should be no sense of Scottish students being somehow pushed out by uh, others. The number of Scottish students uh, in 2021 is at 37,520. That's 10 per cent up on uh, two years before. According to 
UCAS it, data covered in 2021 out of the total number of students getting a place at a Scottish university, 73.6% uh, were Scottish domiciled students. Uh, that was up uh, by nearly 2% from uh, two years before. And in terms of the uh, very important point around widening access, I would uh, highlight the, uh, the recent uh, Funding Council report on widening access that shows 16.7% of Scottish full-time first degree entrants to Scottish universities were from the 20 percent most deprived areas in 2021. That's hitting our target. And of course, there was a report from the Commissioner of Fair Access yesterday which noted that Scotland continues to set the pace in terms of fair access to higher education among the UK nations. Thank you. I know we're running ahead of time. I'm keen to get all the supplementaries and the final question in, but uh, the questions and indeed the answers will need to be brief. Um, Pam Gosal, first of all. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With University Scotland highlighting funding cuts due to the spending review, can I ask the Minister, can he guarantee that the current student numbers cap will be lifted any further, allowing more Scottish students the university places they deserve? Minister Jamie Hepburn. I mean, the member talks about a, a, a cap on places. Of course, we have to lay out a budget, and in laying out a budget, we have to have a number of places at university. That is, of course, the reality. And if, if heaven forfend those members on those benches that are in government, they would have to do uh, the same uh, as well. But what I didn't hear uh, from uh, the member was any word of welcome for the fact that we have. Uh, uh, have a 10% increase in the number of Scottish domiciled students in a two-year uh, uh, period. And, of course, those students are attending uh, universities in Scotland without having to pay fees, unlike elsewhere in the UK, where they have to pay up to £27,750 for the privilege of attending university. And Martin Whitfield. I am very, very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister, with regard to this question over international students, the status of Ukrainian students who are here as refugees but wish to continue their study in Ukraine remotely and are not being granted home status as other Ukrainian students who then take places at our universities? Minister. I am aware, I believe that will probably be a question at the back of a similar email that I have received. I take that issue is serious. Of course, we have put in place uh, an international students' hardship fund so that those students who are already here studying can benefit by that. But I recognise the cohort the member is talking about, and that is something we are looking at actively just now. Thank you. Question number eight, uh, Emma Roddick. Apologies, President Officer, just a moment. Ask the Scottish Government what work it is doing to ensure that young people are educated on the issue of consent. Cabinet Secretary. Relationships, sexual health and parenthood education is an important part of the school curriculum that enables pupils to build respectful, responsible and confident relationships as they grow older. It is for schools to decide how to deliver RSHP education based on the needs of pupils in their classroom. Learning should be presented in an objective and balanced and sensitive manner within a framework of sound values and an awareness of the law. A wide range of teaching resources are available to support the delivery of this education, including the key messages of healthy relationships and consent resource. Emma Roddick. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. We know that many men who commit sexual crimes first do so at a young age. Does she agree that this indicates early intervention and education around what constitutes consent at a young age is required to challenge the normality of young women and girls experiencing rape and sexual assault? And Cabinet Secretary. Well, we do absolutely have to tackle the underlying issues uh, and attitudes that we unfortunately still have in our society that per perpetuate uh, the uh, behaviour that the member was um, talking about. Our curriculum, obviously, within Scottish education covers the ages from 3 to 18, and learning about consent and healthy relationships is commonly in the general, broad general education phase of our education. Within that, there are, of course, experiences and outcomes on relationships, sexual health and parenthood education produced by Education Scotland that provide a clear and concise statement for people's learning and progression at each level um, of that curriculum that is right uh, for uh, children um, at that stage of their learning. That, of course, includes discussion around respect, around boundaries um, and about uh, 
consent. And the government uh, does expect schools to deliver an inclusive and supportive learning environment for their pupils in a way that ensures that they receive high quality relationship, sexual health and parenthood education right across Scotland. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business. Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 4748 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you very much, President Officer, and moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 4748 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. Uh, I am now minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now. I invite George Adam to move the motion. I move, President Officer. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, we are all agreed. There is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 4716 in the name of Nicholas Sturgeon on the Queen's Platinum Jubilee 2022 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. That concludes the decision time and we will now move on to members' business. And I would ask those leaving the chamber to please do so quickly and quietly. Thank you. <laughs>